Today on Scott Synth Stuff, we're going to look at the Korg Poly 800. It's a polyphonic analog synthesizer from 1982. It has eight voice polyphonic. If you play it with one oscillator per voice, you can also play it doubled up with two oscillators per voice for four voice polyphonic. So you can get some interval and detunes. You can store 64 patches. It has 49 keys. It has a digitally controlled oscillator and digitally controlled filter. And that filter is a six stage DCF envelope. It has a single 24 decibel slope filter shared with all the voices. It has MIDI, although it has a unique implementation where it only responds to the notes that are physically on the keyboard. If you send a note via MIDI that's outside the range of the key bed, it just plays it at an octave lower or higher, as the case may be. It has a stereo chorus built in, has a sequencer, has a joystick control, which is used for pitch bend if you push it left or right. If you push it down, it applies the LFO to the filter, and if you push it up, it applies the LFO to the amplitude. It has two guitar strap pegs on the end, so you can play it like a guitar, and it's only 10 pounds. When I got this synth, it was not working, so we're going to fix it, restore it, and then modify it with a Moog Slayer modification. This synthesizer was owned by the husband of a friend who passed away, unfortunately. She sent it to me because she couldn't get any sound to come out of it. It would turn on, but no sound came out. So she sent it to me, and it came in the original box with the original user manual, which is fairly rare, I think. So I unpacked it, checked to make sure all the keys actually functioned, that they actually moved up and down and weren't broken. And then I did the same for all the other controls to make sure they were actually functioning and, and turned and buttons worked and they actually weren't broken. Next, I got Chibi to check it out and she sniffed it all over and gave it a thorough inspection before giving her seal of approval and, well, walking away. All right, looking at the back, we have our MIDI ports, we have a, a foot switch, We've got the tape input output jacks and some switches. We have uh, some switches for the patch management. We have the output jacks and a power jacks. I noticed a lot of uh, fuzz and oxidation in the jacks. So I used some contact cleaner on the jack and then uh, worked on getting that fuzz out of there. Now I have to apologize for the flashing. I, I uh, accidentally set the uh, shutter speed wrong on my camera for this section of the video, so you have to suffer through this for about the next two minutes. Uh, I apologize for that. So it does turn on, as you can see. Uh, the buttons do not work well. Sometimes you press it, you get double presses. Sometimes you have to press something several times in order to get it to work. Uh, I did get sound out of it, but only out of one channel. Uh, I checked to make sure all the keys functioned, and they did. All the keys played normally. I plugged into the headphone jack. I had the similar problem, a lot of noise and static, and only one channel. All right, moving the jacks around, I was able to get a little bit of sound coming out of the left channel. but still with a lot of static and noise. So something is definitely going on with those output jacks that we'll have to have a look at. All right, so let's open the uh, synth up where I removed all the screws out of the bottom of it. And let's have a look inside. It was quite dusty and dirty inside. I started by removing the main board, so I disconnected all the connectors off that main board. The uh, what looks like a tuning board is off to the side. It's screwed down and permanently soldered into the main board so I had to unscrew that as well. There is a ground shield on the bottom that's soldered to the ground on the main board using a resistor. So you have to actually desolder that resistor in order to remove the ground shield from that main board. I did go ahead and desolder that resistor so that I could get a look at the bottom of the board. The battery is definitely leaking and failed. So that will have to be replaced. Unfortunately, it's a tab battery that is permanently soldered to the board.
So I desoldered that battery so that we can replace that. I replaced it with a battery holder that will take a common lithium coin cell. That way, the next time the battery dies, it doesn't have to be desoldered. The pins don't fit the original tabs on the board, so I added a couple wires soldered in place and then soldered those to the pads on the board. Then I used some hot glue on the main board to fasten the battery holder in place so it wasn't flopping around inside. All right, that looks good. I used a standard CR2032 lithium battery. That's in there, it's good to go. So the next person that has to change the battery on this won't have to desolder, they'll just have to pop that battery out. All right, so a lot of the times, the wires that go in and out of these jacks, they get bent and wiggled around and it causes the traces where the connectors connect on the circuit boards to actually break. And that's what causes a lot of the static and problems, but I'm not seeing that here. I'm, I'm wiggling the jacks around and I'm not seeing any movement or cracks in the solder at all. And here's the story. This synthesizer lived in Florida in salt air and the insides of the jacks are just horrendously <laughs> corroded. So I did use some contact cleaner to spray them out, which helped, but it, it definitely was not a solution. So I, I'm gonna have to order some new jacks. Um, the buttons themselves, well, the button board I took out, it has this foam on there that when you touch it, it just turns into powder. So I, I got rid of all that foam. And the buttons themselves, they, they, their history, um, they do open, they're not sealed, um, and they have been discontinued for over 20 years. So I'm not gonna be able to find exact replacements for them. I thought, well, maybe I'll try some contact cleaner. If I could, because they are open, I can spray it in there. So I did that, and then once I finished spraying the contact cleaner, I worked each of the buttons to get the uh, contact cleaner in and around the contacts of the buttons. Now we'll find out if cleaning the buttons makes any difference. I reinstalled the main board, connected everything back up, turned the synth back on. Now because I removed the battery, the memory containing all the patches has been erased. So before we can test the synthesizer out, we have to reload all those factory presets back into it. Originally this thing used a cassette tape. Fortunately you can find it, lots of people have uploaded it as a YouTube video. So I hooked up my phone to it, hit load, press play on the YouTube video and let it go. And the answer was error. So I adjusted the volume on the phone, tried it again and error. So I adjusted the volume on the phone, try it again and error. I've repeated that about 20 more times, adjusting settings, cables, phones, until I finally got good. All right, now the presets are loaded back in. We'll turn it back on and give it a try. So the left channel is definitely back to where it should be. Uh, I do get some static from the cables if they're moved, so the jacks are still not good. Uh, you'll notice that the buttons are much better, but I still do have to keep pressing them several times in a lot of cases to get them to work. So we'll give all the controls a test. All right, back to the buttons. I need to find out what replacement buttons to get for this. And to do that, I have to measure and see what kind of buttons are on here so that I know what to order. There are lots of different tactile buttons you can get and they come in all kinds of different sizes. So it's important to get one that's going to fit both the height and the 
uh, pin hole placement. So we got to measure those pins in the back and especially the height because if they're an incorrect height, they aren't going to work. One eternity later. All right, so my new buttons have arrived. These are the ones that I found. They're Panasonic EVQ PAE 04M. And this is what they look like. Now, th these are the closest I could get. Uh, the pins are a little bit narrower. I'm gonna try just replacing one. So I desoldered one of the buttons. I'm gonna pull that off the board here. There is the old button that I desoldered and pulled off. I'm gonna make sure there's no residue from desoldering left on the board, so we don't want any shorts. Now I just have to bend the pins on one of these buttons just out a tiny bit in order to get to fit correctly. And we'll push that into the board. Now it's very important that the buttons get seated fully against the board or else they'll be the incorrect height. So it looks good. The height looks correct, it's seated correctly. So let's solder it into place. All right, I'm happy with that. So we're gonna go ahead and desolder every single one of these buttons on this board. Now the buttons have been pulled out and we have a look, make sure all the holes are clear, that there's no residue left behind, everything looks good. And now we'll start populating the board with the brand new buttons. And now we'll solder the new buttons in place. New buttons are now soldered on and it looks good. All the buttons are level and seated fully against the board. You can reinstall this into the keyboard. All right, I got a package from Centaur. Centaur is a great company that sells all kinds of parts for old synths and they had all the jacks I needed to replace. So I first tried using my uh, soldering station iron, even though it goes up to 850 degrees, it doesn't have enough uh, oomph to desolder or melt these giant connectors. So I had to figure out the, the big guns, literally the soldering gun. And that's all it was required to get those out. So there's the old one on the left and the new one on the right. You need to make sure it's flush against the board so that it fits into the case correctly. And then you want copious amounts of solder in there because that solder is the only thing holding that jack in place. There's no other mechanical fastener. The audio jacks have capacitors on them, so we need to remove those first. And then we'll go ahead and desolder the audio jacks. and the power jack. All right, new power jack going in. And there's our headphone jack going in. And then the left and right output jacks. A few moments later, and of course I lost one of the capacitors while doing this, so I had to find one from my stock that was the same value. All right, new jacks in place, looks good. We can throw away the old ones. These are the trim pots on the board for the resonance and cutoff for the filter. So this is the modification we're gonna be doing. This is that so-called Moog Slayer modification. So we're gonna to have to remove those. So let's desolder both of those trim pots off the board. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of effort, extra effort to push that out. And there's one of the trim pots there. And we have a pair of 50K audio taper 
potentiometers that we're going to be replacing those with. Now I'm not going to go into all the circuitry and all the, how this gets hooked up in detail. Uh, there's plenty of websites and YouTube videos on the internet that show exactly how this is done. So I'm, this is not going to be a tutorial on how to do this modification. Um, it's been done to death. So just look up Moog Slayer, M-O-O-G-S-L-A-Y-E-R, and you'll find all kinds of information on this modification. So I'm soldering some wires here to these potentiometers and I'm marking which one is which so that I know where they are going to get installed into the case. And the one on the right is the cutoff, the one on the left is resonance. So we'll start installing the wires from those potentiometers into the board. And we do hook up one to the ground, and then there's another one that we hook up to power through a resistor, you can see there on the left. Now this is the Quark filter chip. This chip has 11 pins down the left side. Pin five is a 12 decibel filter output. Pin six is 24. Only pin six is used. This synthesizer only has 24 decibels, but the chip actually puts out both. Pin five isn't connected to anything. Pin six goes to that capacitor on the left. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the trace on the board that goes to that capacitor, then we're gonna replace it with a switch that switches between pin five and pin six and feeds that to capacitor. That way we can switch between the 12 or the 24 decibel filter on this chip that's, that's currently not being used. So here we are, we're very carefully getting into where that trace is on the board and cutting it. Now just make sure there's no little bits of metal left over to shore anything out. We'll tone it out with a multimeter, just make sure that the trace is in fact cut. Here's the switch we're going to use, the standard SPDT, single pole, double throw. The center conductor will be going to the capacitor and the outer conductors will be going to pins 5 and 6 on that chip so that we can switch between the two filters. And there's our switch. So we'll first, the output going to the positive input of that capacitor. And then we'll count down one, two, three, four, five, and six. So those are the pins we want. There's pin six. We're gonna add a little bit of solder there and also the pin five. And that way we can tack solder the wires from the switch onto those pins. All right, we'll just make sure those wires are nice and neat. And now we'll tidy up all the wires. I like using wire ties just to keep the wires together in a bundle. It keeps them from getting tangled up. And the wire ties, if you do need to remove them, you just cut them off and you can replace them again. All right, while I had it apart, I did clean all the potentiometers on here on the, on the joystick and all those sliders with the deoxid cleaner. Here's where I installed the potentiometers and the switch for the modification into the front panel underneath the joystick board. I drilled holes in the top. You can see here's what they look like on the top. And then I had some nice aluminum knobs that I had sitting around, so I, I put those on as well. And of course I had a P-Touch labeler so I put labels on so I can remember what does what. And here's the finished product. So now we're going to give it a try. And as you can see it gives you direct control over the cutoff and resonance which is really nice. 
And the ability to have that 12 decibel filter really brightens things up. I actually really prefer the 12 decibel filter on the synth. Uh, I don't know why they chose to only have the 24 on it from the factory. Now you'll see me increasing the resonance here, which is parameter 42. And you can get it to feedback. So the resonance only works on the resonance that's already set up. So if the resonance parameter is set to zero, turning the resonance knob all the way up will do nothing. So you do have to actually have some resonance set up in parameter 42 in order for that resonance knob to actually do anything. Same thing goes for the filter cutoff. If you have no filter set up, then adjusting the filter isn't gonna do a whole lot. As you can see, the buttons are working really well. No double presses, no missed presses. And I'm just going through checking out a bunch of different presets. By the way, the display doesn't actually flash like that. It's a artifact of the shutter speed of my camera. So here I'm parameter 42. You can hear the resonance coming up as I'm increasing it, which then allows me to adjust it using the knobs. In any case, it's made the synthesizer really a, a usable, playable synth uh, because you have those knobs on the left. Instead of having to go in and edit parameters and, and like you see me there, pressing down and up to adjust resonance for parameter 42, instead you just twist a knob. So it makes it a lot more expressive and playable. And plus having that 12 decibel filter available, the 12 decibel slope filter really brightens the sound and gives it a real edge that it didn't have before. So I really recommend doing both those mods to the Poly 800. So I'm really enjoying this synth. I'm gonna have some fun with it, maybe uh, make a few songs with it. and. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad I was able to save it and, and get it working again. Hope you like what you saw in this video. If you find it of any use or entertaining in, in any way, please click like, subscribe, click that little bell down below, leave a comment, let me know what you thought. Thanks for watching. <laughs>